A promise is a pledge to provide a service. I'm not promising you'll be entertained. I'm not promising we're the best show in town. What I am promising is to teach you biblical truth with practical application. I promise to teach men to fight for their faith, their families, and their futures through the word of God. I'm Douglas Gumby, lead pastor of the Contenders Church. Join us in the fight at contenderschurch.org. Today I want to take a journey in the book of John chapter 12. In the book of John chapter 12, uh, verse 24 through 26 simply says this. Most assuredly I say unto you, unless... Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him will my father honor. I want to take this time and I know um, y'all know where I stand when it comes to stewardship. And a lot of times uh, pastors and leaders have used this this topic to kind of uh, uh, manipulate or or to get something from you. Today, I want to give something to you because I think we all have a misunderstanding of what true stewardship is. Uh, I'm challenged and I say this wholeheartedly as a leader and as a pastor. And I, I realized in the last few weeks uh, of dealing with just life in general, that a lot of the stance that I take as far as the Bible and, and, and my religion and my relationship with Christ, I have had to go back in my life and say, well, this worked, but was it biblical? I had to go back in my life. We'll say this worked out this certain way, but did it line up with the word of God? And so now at 40 years old, I stand and I look at my life and I say, God, you brought me from a mighty long way. But so much have I learned since I stopped operating in what I wanted to do. And I start leaning on what you want to do. I want to talk today on the subject of stewardship. I know as a pastor and as a leader, I face a lot of different things as far as leadership is concerned. But there are many more things that you are dealing with that I have to lead and shepherd you through. And so my prayer is that the word of God be a, a, an open book that I can say one thing, but it go throughout the generalities of our lives. And one of the things that I realized in stewardship is that we get so caught up on money. We get so caught up on the financial part that we fail to realize sometimes that stewardship or money is the small portion of what stewardship is really all about. So let's, let me go in and define, define stewardship for us today. Stewardship is the position and duties of a steward. A person who acts as a surrogate of another or others, especially by managing property, financial affairs, or an estate. The responsible overseeing and protection of something considered worth caring for and preserving. Here Jesus speaks in, in a language of those he encountered because he, he, he found a way to connect with them where they were. You hear in the Bible he talks about a lot to, to the shepherd and to the sheep. He talks to those because in that time frame you had a lot of shepherds and a lot of sheep. So they understood. Here he's talking about in a, in, in, in a, in a sense of farming uh, of, of a grain falling to the ground. Farmers know that you got to find the right time, the right season, the right moment to place a seed in the ground. Then it will grow and produce what? The harvest that you want. Now a lot of preachers, I want to I want to do this, but they'll take the time to say you got to plant your seed and go go ahead and get your offerings together, right? We're not going to do that today. We're going we're going to take care of what we're responsible for, and we're going to also in the series talk about what tithing and giving really is. Y'all think I'm afraid of it? I'm just mindful of how to approach things. Okay, here it is. Jesus spoke in a language to those he encountered and spoke to them in a way that connected with them in their current understanding. Here in John 12, Jesus speaks from a prophet and a lost uh, perspective, but more in a sense of personal responsibility of the liberty that he has come to bestow on all of us. Once we take uh, a personal responsibility for our lives, not just a small part, not just saying I'm a steward of my finances, but I'm a steward of my children. I'm a steward of my life. I'm a steward of my business. I'm a steward of my character and my conduct. Once we take full responsibility of our lives, then we'll begin to see real change in our lives. I'll say this, and I say this all the time. Uh, if you are in the same position you were in last year, 
What hasn't changed? It's not your situation. It's not what you're going through. It's you. It's me. We are responsible for where we are. I know we live in a day and age of naming and claiming. Biblically, that's not sound. Biblically, according to Romans 9 and 14, if I'm not mistaken, God is the only one who can call into existence anything. Not us, not you, not me, not my title, nothing. Only God. So we have to say, why are we uh, where we are? Because we're sitting over here saying the Lord is going to deliver. He will. But what are you going to do while he prepares to bring you out? It's called stewardship. It's called taking responsibility of something that God gave you responsibility for and managing it in a way that he designed. Stewardship is not just about money. Stewardship is about managing what God has given in a manner that would honor him. I want to share a quick story. And this, I didn't know this was going to be a part of it until yesterday. On Friday, I need it because our life has been really hectic. I, I go from 2 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. every day, and I'm, I'm exhausted. But I need to spend time with my family. I needed to reorganize and manage some time with my family. And so as tired as I was, I took a nap, and I said, listen, we're going out tonight. I don't know where we're going. We really don't go out, but I said, I don't know where we're going, but we're going out. And we decided to go to Dave and Buster's. And my, my daughter and my wife said, well, can we bring Chris? That's my nephew. I said, well, cool. I don't have no problem. Let's go. So we went to Dave and Buster's, got something to eat, went to Fellini's. I ate everything that was on my plate. I always have a happy plate. And we went to, uh, not Fellini's, uh, Nancy's Pizza. And, you know, all of the food I ate was, you know, full and good. Uh, but we got to Dave and Buster's. And I, I soon found that I was responsible for my nephew. And here's what I want to leave with you today and talk with us about for the rest of the day. I said to him on many, many occasions, you know, you go to Dave and Buster's and as the game plays, you win tickets, right? You win tickets. And every now and then he won something and he got tickets. And what I would say to him was put this in your pocket. I would take the tickets and I fold them and I put them. He put them personally in his own pocket. He didn't have a clue what the tickets were for. He didn't have a clue what the purpose of the tickets were. But all I said to him was, put this in your pocket. Well, we got on so many games, and he only honestly had maybe 100 tickets. He played all the little tokens up, and when the tokens was gone, we was going to leave anyway. And he ran out of tokens, but he had maybe 100 tickets. And then he went over, and I left him for a few moments on the Colorama with my wife. I come back, he's won 250 tickets. I no longer had room to put them in your pocket, right? So we had to find another place to store the tickets. They have a little cup, put the cups in the ticket, ticket in the cup, and you move forward. All of a sudden, he starts accumulating tickets. So now we've run out of tokens, and it's time to go. And I say, give me what was in your pocket, right? So I had the cup with the 200-plus tickets in it, and, and, and he started pulling stuff out of his pocket. And before you know it, check this out. As he pulled the tickets out, they kept multiplying. I don't know how many was in there, but he would always all of a sudden say, ta-da. <laughs> and he reached in there again, ta-da, and he pulling them out. But what I didn't understand was I was teaching him stewardship. I was teaching him the same way God has done us. He has given us resources, and he simply says, put this in your pocket. Hold on to this. And, and whether you realize it or not, when you need it, he, he says, go check your pocket. And you say, ta-da. And it's nothing that you did. But it's all because God has allowed you to steward or take care of what you have. In the Old Testament, the tithe was only 10%. That means that you had to steward 90%. And how many of us blew it? We had the 90 and we lived off of 95 We had what God let us have in abundance and we blew it. And I simply say it's because we didn't have a simple understanding of what God purposed for us. And I want to take my time today. So for the time that is ours to share, I want to speak from the topic, the best we have. And three things I want to share with you. And as I share with you, remind me to say, put this in your pocket. The first thing I want you to put in your pocket is that there is a proper place for proper grace. There's a proper place for proper grace. 
In John chapter 12, verse 24 and 25, it says, Most assuredly, I say unto you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. I, I want to say this, and I want to I go back to the basics. I really want to set some things straight. God is the author of stewardship. Not you and not me. God is the author of stewardship. That means that we have to establish roles, that God is the owner and we are considered managers. That God is the creator and we are the created. If the creator puts something on this earth, then we are the created and we use what he put on this earth. In Genesis chapter 1, you don't have to turn there, verse 3, verse 6, verse 9, verse 11, verse 14, verse 20, and verse 26, all of them say this, then God said, the Bible opens up with God in charge, not man. I don't know where we got in charge, I don't know, I think it's the pulpits and the, and the titles that put us in charge, but I don't know where we took the ownership role of stewardship. Understand this. I'm a pastor of this church. I'm the pastor of this church. And at the end of the day, I'm responsible for your souls. And I have to make sure that I teach you foundational truths that will allow you to live better because you heard the word. But if I come in and I teach you what I want to teach you because what you learn is going to benefit me, then your blood, ladies and gentlemen, is on my hands. The Bible opens up with God talking, not man. The Bible ups, opens up with God doing, not man. To understand stewardship, we must understand ownership. To understand ownership, you have to understand sovereignty. To start with sovereignty, we have to start with God. As a steward, if you don't put God first, not just like they do on the award show or when we stand in public, but literally say, God, what is it that you want from me? How is it that you want me to manage this life? I didn't say money. This life that you've given me. Everything on this planet, including your finances, have to be managed. Relationships have to be managed. Ideas have to be managed. Conversations have to be managed. In essence, there's an owner and there are operators. I found this out and it blew my mind some years ago. Truett Cathy, the owner of Chick-fil-A, owns all 480 something plus Chick-fil-A stores. He's the only owner. All of the people who have taken ownership of them are considered managers or operators. It's the same way in God's system. Your life is not yours. Your life has been given to you by God to operate in a manner that will honor him. That means you're, going to, you're not going to put your life in a position that won't honor him. You won't put your conversation in a position that won't honor him. Why? Because you're a steward. I'm going to show you something in a few minutes. Walk with me. If we're going to if we're going to understand stewardship, we must settle this argument of ownership. Ownership begins when we understand that anything you own, you don't own because it is the property of another. Okay, I'm going to talk about my favorite car. My favorite car is my 99 Ford Expedition. The, the, Y'all talk about my car. I don't care. That's my car. I, I, I have no payments on the car. Amen. That says to me, Amen. hold on, I'm, I'm, I'm going to mess you up. I'm, I'm going to mess you up real quick. That says to me, I own my car. Or do I? Because if I own my car, I'd own it free and clear. There'd be no money going into the car because I own the car. But we don't consider gas. That's $75 a pop. Twice a week, just for one truck. We don't consider insurance. That, that's, that's another bill. 
We don't consider repair. So in essence, I'm, in, I'm responsible for the car that I paid off, but I don't own it because it still owns me. Amen. If I don't pay my insurance, guess what? I can't drive it on the street. Right. If I don't put $75 worth of gas in it, guess what? It's, it's, <coughs> it ain't going nowhere. So even when you own something, you don't own it. You manage it well. And in, 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 in this perspective, you own in an absolute sense nothing. And, and from this perspective, God in an absolute sense owns everything. And I say it like this. Had it not been for God, I can't put gas in. Amen. Somebody got to. You know, it's, it's not the money that's in my bank. The money that's in my bank dries up all the time. But had it not been for him, he wouldn't have put the money in my bank to take care of what I need to take care of. Amen. We've got to establish ownership Amen. and operatorship. The best we can do is nothing without being in the proper place of God's grace who controls everything in our lives. Put this in your pocket. There's a proper place for a proper grace. Secondly, when, when, when operating in the best we have, not only is there a proper place for a proper grace, there's a proper attitude for a greater gratitude. I feel Jesse uh, Jackson is today John chapter 12 verse 26 part a simply says if anyone serves me let him follow me and where I am my servant will be also I'll stop right there the greatest potential of a steward is when the steward manages what belongs to God as if it belongs to them knowing it's not theirs in the first place. Love my truck. It's not mine. Love my wife. She belongs to God. Love my children. They belong to God. I'm managing the relationship that God has given me. In a manner that honors him. God said to Adam. In, in Genesis chapter 1. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it for you. God blessed them and said unto him. To them be fruitful and multiply fill the earth and subdue it to stand in control to take control of the earth but Adam did not create the earth Adam was placed on the earth after everything was created and he said unto them after he created everything be fruitful and multiply fill the earth and take dominion over the earth but with this understanding you didn't create it Amen. you don't own it Amen. you are simply a manager I want you to function with it based on my purpose for letting you have it Amen. that's what he said to him yes. when, when a steward acts like an owner there's a problem yes. so some of us are, are stewards acting like owners uh, a lot of times uh, <laughs> I sit in a corner at Starbucks and people have come in for the last two and a half years and asked was I the owner because I'm always there I help I feel sugar uh, if stuff is short you know I know where all the stuff is hidden I reach under that grab a handful and I you know because I'm there all the time right so people have asked am I the owner and when they come to me and then they find out I'm just the guy that comes all the time for a long period of time, they're puzzled. But I have to realize, I don't own it. It belongs to somebody else. Matter of fact, we don't even really see eye to eye technically. <laughs> but they make good coffee. But I, while I'm there, I can't operate like the owner. I have no legal right. Amen. Good, good. The problem with the church is... We are preaching to people that we have a legal right to do what we are illegally doing. Amen. Okay, you think I'm lying. We take the word of God and we take what we like our 
out of the word of God and lead the other part that we don't like out, that's an illegal move of an operator acting like an owner. God said sin is sin is sin is sin. Not your big sin, your notice sin, your behind the scenes sin. All sin is sin. But we treat church and the Bible like we spoke it. When you become the master of your own life, there is a problem. There's a poem, Invictus, out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole. I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Beyond the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody, but and bowed. Beyond this place of, of wrath and tears looms but the shadows of the days. And, and, and I hope the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how stark, how dark the gate, how, how narrow something to pole. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul and men have taken this as a personal stance and we have brought too much of the world when we bring the world into the church without leaving the world in the church for God to have Amen. we've come into church with the world and find a way to manage the world in our godly lives man in our day and age wants to get rid of God Man wants to get rid of God in our public education. With our children, we don't want to teach them. We, we, we now want to teach, uh, uh, we, we now want to teach uh, 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 the, 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 this whole transgender and, and, and the lesbian and, and gay agenda. We want to put this in front of a generation who is uneducated. And while they're uneducated, they seeped it in year after year. When I was a child, they seeped it in. When you were a child, and now it's become a public forum. And they just want to, they move proud out of school so they can bring other stuff in. Man wants to get rid of God, even in our public education. Not only in our public education, but our public laws. Yes. They want to remove the Ten Commandments. Our country was based on the foundation of God and, and our freedom to believe. That's what they tell us. But now they want to take our beliefs because it, it is uh, politically incorrect. Number one, let's, let's talk about politically incorrectness. Uh, because politically, uh, I have never seen anything correct. You'll catch that tomorrow. I'm going to move on. When, not just get rid of God, but I think that the, the, the understanding of man is that we don't want to answer to anybody. We, we don't want to be answerable to anybody. I, I'm, 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 a, I'm a man who is a man's man. They would call me atypical. It means I'm, it's, I work with people, but it's very difficult for me to work for people. I, I am what is considered my own boss. Even though I work for somebody, I handle it like I own or I'm in charge of what I do. There's an attitude that this generation has picked up that has been seeped in for years. There's a man I speak of quite often every now and then, name of uh, Alistair Crawley. Alistair Crawley is also known as the Beast. Uh, he is considered, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Barbara Bush's father. And, and, and this gives you the history. Uh, but he, he has this phrase of do what thou wilt. You see Jay-Z, he'll have that shirt on and a couple other people had a statement because uh, he, uh, they say he's responsible for all of this uh, Illuminati type stuff and, and all the things that we deal with. But that's the attitude that has transcended into the church. And the church has allowed, I know that you ain't going to stop that, but the church has allowed things that before we wouldn't have never allowed. The church has settled things and, and open the door for things that God has rebuked. I don't mind sinners coming in the door. But they can't leave the same way they came in. Why? Because the power that God has given to us by the word should transform them. They didn't come in because their life was so together. 
They came in because they don't have any answers. But if the church coddles them, if the church makes them feel comfortable, if the church tries to be politically correct with everybody, then sin is going to reign not only in your mortal bodies, but it's going to reign in the church. I know I'm preaching today. The attitude of a steward is, God put me here to rule what belonged to him. As an owner, as an operator, I have to make decisions not based on emotions, but based on fact. Okay, if, if you were in my position and you are in your own home, you are an entrepreneur of your house, you have to make decisions in your own house. And you make those decisions based on what is best for your house. And Joshua 24 says this, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And if you don't want to serve him in this house, then you're more than welcome to get your credit up and get your own. And I might just be nice enough to give you a time limit. Might. Might. <laughs> Put this in your pocket. When, when given the best we have, there's a proper place for proper grace and there's a proper attitude for greater gratitude and, and lastly proper service proper responsibility Amen. proper service proper responsibility John chapter 12 verse 26 part B simply says this if anyone serves me him will my father honor we often read in scripture and, and hear Jesus speaking of servants and serving uh, what does serving entail? What does this, this serve entail? Because what we've done in church is, is we've taken servanthood back to slavery almost. Uh, I need armor bearers to be with me to carry my water when my hands work perfectly fine. I need, I need somebody to be with me to because uh, I need this tight chair. I'm, I'm very finicky. We got two, we got two of the same chairs, but I need this one because this one is square and that one is round and I bought this one first and my butt can't tell the difference but I want this one. We, we've taken slavery and called it servanthood. I'm, I'm going to give you the definition of serve, of serve in a few seconds after I get me a swig of water. Serve means to perform duties or services for another person. Or organization, doesn't that not sound like a steward? Yeah. Is that not almost verbatim the same? You can look it up. I didn't make this up. Uh, is that not almost the same definition verbatim? Let me ask this then. Jesus said, if anyone serves me, him will my father honor. My question is, how do we serve Jesus? I'm going to answer it too. I'm not narcissistic. I try to keep my face off Facebook. I've been talked about. Uh, okay, let's move on. <laughs> I'm asking questions and answering them. We serve Christ by being who he created us to be. Plain and simple. We, we serve Christ by following his instructions. I'm going to back all this up in a few minutes. We serve Christ by using the resources that he has provided. Do I need to say it over again? We serve Christ by being who he created us to be. We serve Christ by following his instructions. We serve him by using the resources that he provides. Fourthly, by remembering the gift he is to us. And lastly, by sharing the gift he is to others. Five things on how we serve Christ. And I'm going to back it up with scripture. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, turn to John chapter 21. And I'm going to go in and highlight and pull because I don't want to read all of it. It's a lot of text, but I want to walk us through how we serve Christ. The first one was we serve him by being who he created us to be. John chapter 21 and verse 3. Simon Peter said unto them, I go a fishing. They said unto him, we also go with thee. Peter was what? A fisherman. Peter was a fisherman and he had a natural desire to go fishing. 
right? So he was just being who he was. Besides uh, fishing, I love motorcycles. Don't have one yet. Working on it. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Narcissistic moment. I'm back. Um, but there are things that you just absolutely love. And you have to do because they help you to be who you are. Right? So being yourself is serving Christ. Here's the issue. We come in church and are we ourselves? We come in church and we lose the identity of who we are to give the identity of who we think other folk think we should be. Some people have a problem because I don't wear turn around collars and robes no more. I can't follow him because he doesn't say God. Or man of God. I can't get with him because every now and then he goes to Second Avenue Decatur. And so, no, no, we, we get caught up on perceptions. Now, I know, I know preachers. I know preachers. And I'm good, good friends with preachers. And, and I watch the way we interact in the streets. Or when we go speak together. It's totally different. Now my question is. I'm not judging or, or saying that they're fake. But are you being who God created you to be? Or are you living the perception of what people want you to be? Peter said I want to go fishing. The other said unto him we're going to go with you. They went forth and they got into a ship immediately. And the night. At night, they caught nothing. That's verse 3. Go down to verse 5. We, we serve Christ by following his instructions. Here it is. They've encountered Jesus, but they didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus is on the shore. They are about 200 plus feet out, and they can't really tell, 200 yards out, and they can't really tell if it's him. Jesus said unto them, children, do you have any meat? And they answered to him collectively, no. We fished all night. This story is so familiar. This is another one. We fished all night, but we ain't catch nothing. He said unto them, following his instructions, we serve him. Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and you shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fish. You serve Jesus, you serve Christ Jesus by being who he created you to be. You serve him by following his instructions. You serve him by using the resources that he has provided. That's stewardship. John chapter 21 verse 8 and verse 9. And the other disciples came in a little ship for they were not far from land. For it was, they were 200 cubits dragging the nets with fish. Who provided the fish? Jesus. God, remember, they had just fished all night. They didn't catch anything. They followed his instructions, and in serving him, they followed his instructions and threw it on the right side of the boat. This is your right. This is mine. When they threw it on the right side of the boat, they had trouble bringing the fish in. Now, here's the thing. When we don't follow instructions, look at the same text. The fish we're on the right side of the boat. When we don't follow instructions, we are operating on the wrong side. The fish are here. I'm doing my will here. Saying, Lord, your will be done. But I'm operating in my will. I'm not following instructions. God is providing over here. But I keep searching over here. We serve Jesus by being who he created us to be. I want you to really think about this. By following his instructions. By using the resources that he provides. And, and he said this, and, and I didn't go down. Verse 9 and verse 10. As soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and a fish laid thereon, and bread. And Jesus said unto them, bring of the fish that you have caught. Now, the Bible tells us that they caught about 150 fish. About 150 fish. Now, bring all the fish that you caught. That sounds like he taking everything. Don't it? 
And when we come to church and we had that offering bucket go by, it feel like he taking everything. That's my get my hair done money. For some, that's my I need my lights on money. For others, I, I, I just need to have something. It ain't number $30, but I need to have it in there for peace of mind money. And when God asks you for those resources, not, not the preacher, notice I say it when God asks you for those resources, he's not taking everything from you unless a grain of seed, seed will fall into the ground and dies. Right now, I'm standing before you as your leader. And I've calculated all of the things that we're going, the resources that we're going to use just to move into the building. My heart stops some moments. Because I'm saying, we're making this move. I, I don't sign the papers. I'm going before the county. The architect is, is so many thousand dollars and and, and, and we going before the county and we got to fill this out and, 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 and we got we to gotta pass the codes. It ain't just moving in because God said move in. No, we got to go according to the law of the land. And when I look at what we have as resources, I'm basically looking at taking this and pouring 99% of it out. And the only piece that I have right now is that unless that seed goes into the ground, it can't multiply. We started this ministry with $748 in the bank. Y'all weren't there. Y'all weren't sitting at a table. $748 in the bank. And God brought us here from 2010 until 2014. So at the end of the day, do you think I'm worried about how much I got to spend to do what God called me to do or am I going to stand in faith and be the example to you that God will take your little and make it more than you ever can imagine. Now, I'm not preaching no hopes and no dreams that can be shattered. I'm saying if you simply trust in him because had it not been for him, that wouldn't be there to pull out. <laughs> y'all, y'all fail to realize. Hey, I, I, I don't want you to be fooled by none of this. I'm not. I'm not a success story by any stretch of the imagination. But I trust the God that I serve. My Bible says that He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ever ask or think. But we limit God because we want to keep a tight seal on what belongs to Him in the first place. So my attitude has become, God, you gave it to me Amen. and you're going to give it to me again, Amen. but I'm going to be faithful. And if you say we lose all to get what you say we're supposed to have, then that's what's going to happen. Amen. We serve God by being who he created us to be. We serve him by following his instructions no matter how hard they are. We serve him by using the resources that he has provided because we remember the gift that he is to us. When we remember the gift that he is to us, this is what we see. John chapter 21, verse 15 through 17. So when they had dined, Jesus said unto him, Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, John, Lovest thou me more than these? And Peter said, Yea, Lord, you know I love you. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. Verse 16, he said unto him again the second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said unto him, Yes, Lord, as if he didn't hear. You know I love you. This time he didn't say my lambs, the immature ones who don't know, who need to be nurtured, who need to be grown, who need to be groomed, who need to be trained. But this time feed my sheep. The sheep now are those who know, who are well aware of dangers and surroundings, 
who, 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 who have moved throughout life unaware of the dangers, unaware that they were right on the verge of being in a wolf's mouth. Amen. These sheep God is referring to are the church. The church needs, needs feeding. The church needs more than three hots, a cot, a hoop, and a shout. You need to walk out of here with some word in your life so that you go home and be a better steward to your husband, your wife, your children, your family first. Amen. He said unto him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? This time the Bible says Peter was grieved because he said this three times in a row. Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, you know all things and you know that I love you. And he simply said unto him again, feed my sheep. When we serve Christ, we're being who he created us to be. We're following his instructions. We use the resources that he has provided. We remember the gift he is to us. And lastly, we share that gift with others. The best you have is not in your bank. The best you have is not stored away in a 401k. The best you have is not the house that you live in. The best you have is not the car that you drive. Understand those things you have been called to manage, to steward. You've been called to serve. That's the same thing. Stewardship, servanthood are one and the same. You use who you are. You follow instructions. You use your resources. You remember who God is to you. And you share that with others. That's when you're giving the best you have. When you give the best you have, there's a proper place for proper grace. There's a proper attitude for greater gratitude. And there's proper service, proper responsibility. Amen. Put that in your pocket. Father, I thank you. I'm going to thank you for something that's really strange right now. I thank you for the pressure. Thank you for the training. Thank you for the problem. Thank you for the issue. Thank you for the circumstance that you alone have provided and you can make a way to escape. Thank you, God, for bringing us to this place. Thank you that at the moment you've designed, you're going to say, you remember what I told you to put in your pocket? Pull that out. And we're going to simply say to you, ta-da. God, I simply thank you. I magnify you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.